Okay, hi. All right, I'm going to actually talk to you about um, the PowerPoint that's up uh, with uh, that says conflict theory, and there's quite a bit in there. I'm actually, uh, if you look now, you will have a new PowerPoint up that's revised. Uh, nothing much different, just added um, a, a few things that kind of make sense of like why that's there. Um, the reason why that PowerPoint is there um, is because when I'm introducing a course to conflict theory, I think that it's important to um, understand a little about Karl Marx as a sociologist and also some of his ideas as an economist because um, that's very important to understand conflict theory and, it, and what it means uh, under capitalism to Karl Marx. So um, I'm going to put up a picture um, hopefully here um, for a moment and it may just flash on the screen hopefully and um, uh, then continue talking to you because I haven't quite figured out how to do a video and show the screen without purchasing software. So um, I may be doing that but for now I'm just going to um, show you uh, Karl Marx on the screen for a moment. Okay, so hopefully you're looking at your PowerPoint um, and the introduction of Karl Marx. So I basically um, have a little Lego guy, um, so he doesn't look so intimidating because he gets some bad rap. But um, he is a, an economist, but he's also a sociologist. And um, it's important to, to know the time uh, that a theorist was theorizing uh, because that actually, uh, for sociologists at least, uh, believe that that contributes to the reasons why we see the theories that we do. Him theorizing in the time of the Industrial Revolution is significant because there was this pretty obvious to him um, social aspect of labor. He saw the factory and that there was this product made that um, very, many people had their own part to play every day and uh, put to, put the part together. Someone may usually have a water bottle here or, or something. We have um, the mouse, but I guess he didn't have a mouse then, so it doesn't make sense. What did they have then? We can say pen making machines maybe, right? So somebody had to come up with the design, then they had to take the raw material and um, maybe flatten that out and then roll it back up to shape like this and then dye it and those things and, and all together when everyone worked together at the at the end of the day you had a pen um, and so Karl Marx saw this as, as really a, a social process um, and so therefore it, he was um, able to see that the, the workers were actually producing these items and then uh, they were kind of being removed from the workers and given to someone who owned that means of production and um, then in exchange for a pittance you know wage that often they couldn't even afford to buy back the product they just made um, so he uh, goes very deep into these things in the uh, books like Manifesto of the Communist Party and Das Kapital um, and his focus was generally social inequality and on the uneven and unfair distribution of resources in society. Um, conflict theory is associated most with Karl Marx. This uh, is, uh, was supposed to help you um, to uh, understand um, um, conflict theory and how it came about. Functionalist theory, which you've read about or should have by now, um, really was about that there's a function to to everyone's place in society. There's a reason why women cook and men go to work. And there's a reason why some people are poor and some people are rich and some people um, do certain things that other people don't. That there's always this function, there's this big body and everybody's working in, um, in, uh, um, in connection with one another. Uh, Karl Marx kind of comes along and criticizes that, that functionalist theory that actually we're not just happy, joyous, and running around all working together, that there's actually conflict and that there are people who are benefiting um, from uh, people's positions in society as far as wage labors um, and um, it, in, that, in, in that process, um, you know, someone, there's someone benefiting at, at the expense of someone else and that's always kind of going on. And um, so that's kind of a basic. I'm, I'm gonna now show you a screenshot of the uh, capitalist um, cycle of production according to Marx and then explain that. And um, so hopefully you can pull that up on your PowerPoint until I figure out how to make this happen all at the same time. Okay, so, so pull up that uh, 
Okay, so here I've got my PowerPoint up. And um, so you should be looking at this slide that says, in order to understand alienation and how conflict operates um, under capitalism, you should understand Marx's version of labor-based profit and the cycle of capitalist production. You may already be aware of this, and if you've taken my class before, you have heard this, because uh, I go through this in just about every class, um, because I feel like it's just really important to really understand conflict theory for me. So the first thing is that capitalists own the means of production. So um, you, according to Marx, there's, there's really kind of two classes. You have ownership, the bourgeoisie, and the proletariat, the workers. And, and to him, capitalists really are the bourgeoisie. They own the means of production. We go to the, the place, the factory, or whoever has that machine that we operate, we go to them. You have to think because there was a time of feudalism where under feudalism we owned our own kind of tools and we were more, more or less like contracted out, bringing our own tools and being able to make more of a decision for ourselves and then uh, reaping the benefits uh, directly from the sale of um, our our pr products that we could make with our own hands and our own tools. Um, and so um, this, this change over to someone owning these machines and then hiring workers. So they need people because they don't want to operate the machines themselves. They own it. They want someone else to operate it. They'll pay them um, a low wage. So they're going to hire them at a very low wage. Um, and according to Marx, this, this concept of labor-based profit, to him, he sees the profit the bourgeoisie is making is derived off of the unpaid labor, off of the sweat of the workers' backs, in, in essence. The unused labor force, there's, there's always an unused labor force. There's this, this uh, always um, unemployed people willing to work. So this allows that ownership class to pay the lowest wage to the worker uh, because they're always kind of under threat that, hey, there's someone else in line for your job. So people are willing to work for these very low wages. Um, and there's this competition between workers, which is important, that can kind of break up our community. When you go to study alienation, the four types of alienation, which you'll need to know, I'm sure, is on your um, a study guide, that the there's an alienation between the workers. And this is how that happens, is that we're in competition for scarce jobs. And whereas we might be a community and coming together um, to make our pen, um, instead we are now fighting uh, to get that one position to operate that machine all day long um, to get our pittance. Instead of this, this kind of more rich community uh, participatory uh, economic system where we all work together to produce for ourselves. Instead, we're separated out and alienated from one another is what Marx is talking about in alienation. So, um, these another another thing that unique about Marx is instead of looking at each worker individually, he kind of sees us as, as one big, huge class or the proletariat. And in doing that, it, it's produces very interesting perspective in that he sees us as producing the life-sustaining items we actually required to buy back with our paycheck. So if you work and you um, know what it's like to get the paycheck and then you pay out for, say, um, uh, your, your rent or your car payment, well, to him, other workers are making those things. Other workers are, are building your car. Other workers um, are, um, are paving the road, you know, um, and which you're then paying taxes for. And other workers are building the apartments. And um, in, instead of, uh, so he sees it as the pay you're getting, you're literally giving right back to the, to the owners. So it's almost this bizarre form of almost slave labor. Um, we're getting paid the pittance, which we usually pay back. Now, if you have a whole lot of money left over after you pay those things, then, you know, fantastic. But the, the, the kind of more lived reality for people is that they don't. They live paycheck to paycheck. And food, even food production, the food you purchase, the workers um, uh, grow the food, pick the food, process the food, <laughs> package the food, drive the food to your grocery store, sell the food at the grocery store. Those are all workers. And so you're pretty much paying right back for the items that other workers have produced. So um, what happens is that we can't, we begin to not be able to afford to buy back the items. You're hungry. That's what people have um, uh, food insecurity where they're 
they can maybe eat but not really well. Um, you're, you're living in very cramped quarters if you can afford anything. A lot of people who work are homeless, cannot afford to buy back um, the products. So moving on in this very densely written <laughs> um, slide that I wrote um, actually years ago. Um, the difference between wage and price is an inability to buy back the goods the workers produce. So more wealth goes to the capitalists and less to the workers. So Marx actually kind of foresaw this um, uh, wealth accumulation at the top, um, which we actually are seeing very, very clearly. And uh, as you read your inequality chapters, Lots of evidence of that. If you look at the fifth quintile um, in Heiner, in his illustrations, he illustrates how in, in the top 1%, how their, their profits are, and their accumulation of wealth is just increasing, where everyone else is either like this or almost really almost declining in, in going into debt, actually. So Marx foresaw this a long, long time ago. Um, and so when workers lose this purchasing power and we can't buy back the products, what happens to the economy? It screeches to a halt, and then we see an economic bust. In the process of the bust, lots of small businesses go out of business, and we see the bigger guys able to um, kind of eat up and gobble up the, the smaller businesses, creating less and less competition, more and more monopolies, and these kind of like monster corporations that we see today. Um, so that being said, um, if you look at your... Um, alienation um, slide. Now hopefully alienation makes a lot more sense. Alienated from work means that we're like kind of worker bees and we're kind of like um, maybe <laughs> beavers or ants where we would work together. We're communal kind of people. We'll actually work together, build together, organize together. Um, instead of doing that together, we're now kind of ripped and separated from one another and told by someone else what we're going to be working on today as opposed to waking up and saying, I think we're going to help um, you know, the Joneses down the street fix their roof. We're not going to do that. We're going to actually go to this other place that we're told to do. So we're, we're alienated from our work, our action, our activity we would be doing. From ourself, I think of self as time. So we're alienated from ourself, meaning we're alienated from our lifetime. All the time we spent at work would be doing something else with the one life we have to live. So alienation from self is like our time, our, our lifetime. Alienation from workers, I've already explained um, that those competition for scarce jobs, I don't know how many of you are going into programs that are competitive um, or, or um, going into a job field that may be competitive, it kind of alienates us from our fellows where we could work together and, 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 and create uh, this kind of world we wish to see together. Instead, we're, we're just fighting over one another to apply for that one job. And then our species being, or all those things added together, what's left if there's no time, no all our activity that we can do with our bodies and our fellow community, what's kind of left of being human is what Marx is saying. So I hope that this, um, if you watch this video, that it helped you make kind of sense of that. In conflict theories, what he's saying is that all of these things that are kind of happening in our situations and our, our social processes um, are, are occurring in an environment of capitalism all over the world. It's impossible for us to really look at any society outside of capitalism right now because everyone's living in it. Even in countries we call communist are not really communist because they're using money and they're using a wage labor system. So there's this misconception about um, what communism really, communism really is. And if you look at the root term commune and think of a commune, the images that come to mind are hippies running around naked or whatever it is, that that's actually kind of more of the idea of communism, that we work together as a community to feed ourselves, house ourselves, clothe ourselves, educate ourselves, and enrich our lives. Um, and uh, money uh, and an actual wage labor system where there's still money being involved and people working for someone else is not communism. Um, it may be some form of uh, what we would call Maoism in China or possibly um, Stalinism in Russia. Um, uh, in Cuba, uh, we've actually called that, that was actually a... Um, uh, a revolution of peasants, not so much um, this type of communist, very organized system that Marx is advocating that workers just kind of take back the means of production and start producing for ourselves. Um, and, and 
as long as we're under this wage labor system where profit is being derived off the workers backs and we only have to sell our labor for money um, we will experience uh, this form of this alienation and, and until we end the wage labor system we won't really see an end to inequality so we'll have inequality and, and the social problem aspect is really how we define how much inequality is a problem um, it depends on in the eye of the beholder if you read your chapter on social problems um, that I'm sure hopefully that you understand that social problems are constructed they're social construction some people might think HIV is a social problem and we need to address it others might think no I, I really don't think it's that important others might even go on to think it's kind of granted from God to to get rid of people who shouldn't be on earth or something so there's all kinds of ideas about social problems and how we should solve them um, and so uh, from the viewpoint of a con conflict kind of theorist that to reduce inequality is the solution to social all social problems from a conflict perspective um, and in the its most extreme form is to eliminate um, all class um, kind of differences and uh, create just what we already have really is one kind of big working class um, and uh, kind of a the, the haves and maybe the have-nots. And we have some folks in between, but we're seeing more and more this stretch happening from this, this very small group of people um, having a lot of wealth and, and most people being struggling financially. Um, and so that for conflict theorists, the, the idea is to bring that kind of more level. Um, and, 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 and people have many different ways of uh, how they think we can accomplish that. Uh, but that that is, is a primary source of conflict for conflict theorists. And so whenever you're asked, what is a conflict view of gender inequality? Um, you're always going to think that who is uh, at an advantage um, in that situation, a racial inequality. Which racial identity is, is getting kind of the most out of this deal um, with having some races um, you know, being ascribed to having less um, uh, also sexual orientation other uh, certain um, like heteronormative uh, kind of ideas that we have and then there's there's and, and what happens in, and then there's um, uh, people who are or don't identify as, as heterosexual they are um, maybe queer um, transgender um, various um, identities which we'll look at a gender bred person next <laughs> in the next segment that might make that more make more sense the kind of connection between gender and sexuality but but the, the idea bottom line is that these other identities uh, create a problem for us in the labor force um, they create scenarios where we're relegated to and I say we because I'm a woman um, relegated to kind of a substandard status that keeps us from acquiring those things that we need uh, power um, and in prestige, which is, is kind of a Weberian theory, which you should also be reading in your book. Um, but but with a, from a conflict perspective, that I'm a worker, and that I'm, I'm and I'm uh, oppressed in that way that I cannot uh, I'm having a uh, I cannot come go from from worker to to kind of very rich. <laughs> it, not many people can anyway, and, and that it's even more difficult for some based on certain characteristics of their identity, if that makes sense. So, um, whereas if we didn't have capitalism, let's say, um, you know, we, we might still see um, prejudice and things um, in, in other ways and in, in exclusion um, from getting the, the means necessary to survive in society. Um, and so some, it, this is all kind of just very philosophical, I know, and I know it's kind of confusing, but um, I, some people tend to think that, um, you know, they kind of tend to neglect explaining capitalism and its role in conflict theory. But what I'm saying is that even if we eliminated capitalism, we might still see conflict and possibly above uh, around those lines of gender, race, sexual orientation, um, even in a commune situation, um, so that there's still conflict. Um, the point is, is that it's at someone's disadvantage to someone's advantage, um, based on our social structure 
uh, if we, let's say if we valued <clears throat> um, in, in this, in let's say the, the a dominant um, um, ideology that we really, uh, we valued, uh, let's say, I'm trying to think of something not too painful, um, transgender, for example. In some cultures, actually transgender are almost spiritualized. They're almost like they're held up as um, there's they're some, or, or intersex, uh, there's some very unique, uh, very, very special something that they have to give and offer the community. In other cultures, they're, they are viewed as uh, quite, uh, quite badly. You know, they're called names, made fun of, poked fun, maybe even bullied, um, and 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 um, shunned from mainstream kind of social processes. And so, um, conflict theory always asks, who in this in this culture is is getting an advantage, and who is at a disadvantage. Um, you know, so in a situation where transgender was was just seen as like almost a holy thing or a or just a uh, a very a special special thing that that you would get a certain status, um, then it would be to their benefit and and to others disbenefit. You know that now we, we I can't take that position because I'm not transgender. Um, in another culture, the same conflict. You know, there's still a conflict. However, it takes a different shape that we don't uh, value transgender in that way. Uh, we actually value heteronormity. So if someone's heterosexual kind of gets the, you know, you're, you're normal. Everything works for you. Disney will fit you. You will understand the, the ads for wedding rings and weddings. And, um, and you'll, you'll very normalized that you're heterosexual. And if you come along with stories of transgenderedness, or even look and appear um, not gender fitting into a certain gender category, you will be relegated to a, a kind of a sub um, status in in, a, in like maybe in, let's say American culture, um, mainstream American culture. So conflict theory, um, uh, very very uh, critical of functionalism that that we're not all just functioning together and we don't have all these. But there's actually all these processes of advantage and disadvantage and we're all struggling and, and butting heads trying to acquire and to get um, where we need uh, what we the things that we need and, and the solution to Karl Marx was that to operate as a class to recognize our social class and to work together that doing that um, we can all have so much um, and uh, that's kind of expressed um, hopefully through each chapter um, so hopefully that kind of made sense, um, even if it didn't, like I said, this is kind of very philosophical, and I think as you apply um, these theories it, to, in each chapter as we go forward, you're going to get more and more comfortable with it. But I wanted you to know about what this, um, what this slide was about, and I guess for me, I always get a lot out of... Um, out of lectures, so it's just me. I, I'm not a, a great online learner without some video. <laughs> so I like to assign a lot of videos, um, and so hopefully I'll make more of these. You don't have to watch these. I'm um, just in the if you watch this one, you don't have to watch these. Um, feel free. It's just I'm just putting these up for for those of you that it might help um, or want to watch and. Um, and um, so, and I feel better that I feel like at least the information's there the best I can communicate it. You can reverse it and play back. <laughs> that might be frightening um, for me, but uh, hopefully, hopefully that helps some. Um, it's very, these are some very um, bizarre, I think, kind of uh, topics if you've never been exposed to sociology. Um, but um, hopefully I'll be help you explain conflict theory a little. And if you want me to do ones on symbolic interactionism or feminist theory or um, critical constructionism, I'd love to do it, um, or functionalism. I'd be glad to do that. Just ask and I'll give a lecture. Okay. All right, you guys, good luck with everything. Bye-bye.